everybody, and welcome back to You Can't Win. This is Tom here, and I'm joined by Don, as usual. Today, we're going to be fielding some questions that you guys have been sending in to us at The Curious Cat. So the first one is, who would win in a fight, Tom or Don? Oh, Tom. Yeah, no, there's no... I don't think there's a question about that, yeah. That's right. Um, I use my Muslim Kung Fu, and I yeah. whoop your ass. I was thinking more like Finnish, you know, like the... I don't know, like you've got like <laughs> warrior strength or something. And plus, I mean, Full look at, seat. yeah, look at the winter war and stuff, right? Like, yeah, Slavs against Finns. That was not, you know, we got. Oh, yeah. I got, forgot that was Slavs versus Finns. Yeah. 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 Man, Finns kicked their asses. That was awesome. Yeah. I love the winter war. <laughs> like, reading about the, the tactics they use and stuff. Have you ever yeah. looked at that? No, no. But uh, I don't know. I feel like if I were in that kind of uh, war situation, I would be like sort of like the fourth guy in line for the rifle kind of thing right like like they, <laughs> they would be like the guy at the front that had the rifle and then three people would have to fall before i finally got it and i would already be out of breath like i would already not be able to um, pick it up and keep going so i don't know yeah i i feel i mean as i am now i'm just like some soft schlubby american guy. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. any kind of fight or whatever but yeah. there's like something in my brain that i think like under the right conditions i would be one of those like psycho berserker types you know? <laughs> okay. I could just yeah, yeah, yeah it was like uh one thing that they used to do in the winter war was they would have two guys one with uh like a molotov cocktail and the other guy with a submachine gun and they would ambush uh tanks yeah so they they throw the the cocktail on top of the tank and it would explode the, the uh the engine on the back and yeah. then all the people would try to like get out of the tank and they would gun them down. Now those two guys that did that were like almost always killed in the act because it's not yeah. just like a lone tank. It's like a whole column of them. And, and sure, sure. But, uh, you know, two guys for a, a whole crew in a tank is, is pretty good. So yeah, I, I feel like I'd, I'd be willing to do that. Like, yeah, it was like a good way to go out. I, I think that's a, I mean, there is something about war like that, that where it's good to humble yourself maybe to some degree, like to think about that kind of stuff. I don't know. I always, I, I've said this before, but I always think of like someone landing on a beach on D-Day or something like they've spent all those months preparing yeah. just for that one moment. And then they, you know, they get eaten up by machine gun fire or something like that pretty quickly or something. You know, it's like, it's like, I don't know. There's so much of that in war where you're just playing. It's really at this level, like now, nowadays, at least like just statistics playing out kind of thing like mm -hmm. the more that you read about world war ii it's just like in 1943 they're like okay let's figure out what we're going to do after the war or something right like they they already know every stage of what's going to happen basically in their minds you know over the next you know five years or something because it's already gotten to the statistically like the planners know that they're going to win kind of thing right the right rest, you know so it's, it's like, like chess moves or something <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah they're just like okay we're already we're all we're already, uh, you know, on top of things here. We just got to, I don't know. But I don't know. It's funny because it's like, you know, the baseball statistics thing. It's like you still have to actually do it, right? You still have to actually right. have the guys there. And I don't know. There's something like horrific to me about that. Just the idea of being one of those guys just having to go through the motions or something. I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, our next one here is what's Don's take on Zizek's read on the cynical contract of the Catholic church that you can just pretend to renounce and then do what you like. God has you covered. He uses climb every mountain from the sound of music as an example of this. So do you understand what he's talking about here? Um, yeah, I think, I think I know what he means, but I haven't, I haven't, have you done like read more about this or I don't know about Zizek's particular yeah argument here it sounds kind of familiar but i guess the basic idea is that it's he, he says it's cynical so i guess that the you know the believer just goes to the church doesn't have to deal with their sins anymore because of yeah you know, or, because of all the you know the confessions and all that kind of stuff and then that's yeah. basically so, a sanction of sinful behavior in a way but yeah so the, the the problem in some respects is that you're it's it's hard because it's 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 supposed to be sincere right like you're not supposed to yeah. it's like it's not, I don't know. And that is actually a, a huge institutional problem at the end of the day, because you can't really police sincerity except for like refusing service or, you know, like just really, really. And then if you were doing that and you already have this idea that everyone's a sinner, then it's like, you just wouldn't have a church after like a year or two. You know what I mean? Like you just wouldn't mm -hmm. have. So I understand the. So I think this is part of like Zizek's like more broader uh, thing about that. The only way that institutions survive is by you know, having sort of like a public face, which says these are the rules. And then to be part of that 
elite in that system or like even just a member at some level. You have to be constantly, deliberately breaking those rules knowingly together with other members to, it's like the rule itself creates the violation of the rule so that uh, there's the solidarity in that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So I think that like people point this out a lot with stuff like sexual abuse because they say, you know, it's it's groups of people might be abusing people and then, you know, it's like the knowledge that they know together kind of adheres in the institution and stuff. So, I mean, that's like the basic idea of the blackmail Epstein stuff, whatever that we talk about sometimes. Right. But, like, right. but uh, it is one of those things that's just pervasive throughout any sort of institution and things. So I think he's using that as the example of sort of the historical, you know, I, I, he's he's drawing on like Freud here, like the the idea of like uh, Moses, I guess, or something like the the basic uh, foundational crime of, you know, the brothers killing the father or something like that. You know, I can't remember the exact detail. It's this, you know, this long, it's a story about how social solidarity comes from founding crimes and stuff. And uses right. that, uh, the, has that as like, uh, yeah, but it's one of those things where, it's hard because the rule is it's you know if that's true in a structural way then it, rules don't exist at some level right like they just don't yeah it's yeah. like it's like there's no root to them you know at, at any stage so that you know so i think at level you can say this is how institutions tend to function but you also have to say like you know because it's funny because Zizek like complains about postmodernism a little bit in public when he's you know going against some of the pop stuff around it right but you can still tell that he really really deeply believes a lot of that kind of basic underlying uh thing because he uses that as a you know a way to kind of get into rebuilding hegel and stuff after those debates kind of thing right but he still accepts almost all of the same kind of you know in a lot of ways i think assumptions or something there i don't know so yeah i don't know i mean it's a uh, yeah i feel like there's there's something there that's difficult to grasp about how you you know, how do you police something that is by definition impossible to police or something, I guess? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah I think you can go way too far with that sort of argumentation yeah. where anytime there's an institutional response to something, oh, it's just enabling the the thing that it's trying, that's ostensibly it's trying to resolve. So like, yeah, you know, some kind of like welfare system. Oh, that's just there to maintain the overall economic yeah. hierarchy. It's not actually helping, you know, the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that that can go way too far, and like you were saying, the in the, in the uh, context of religion, that a kind of confession is really about the person and God. It's the the whole social aspect. I, I don't think that you can put the if that's being abused in some way. Like I don't think you can put that on the the fact of confession itself or something yeah. like that or repentance um but the there is a secondary sort of problem after that though that comes up which is like if you know that that's going to happen you have you have to have some sort of institutional response to continue the yeah. debate which is you know it's stuff like uh um you know you can talk about chastity in in theory but if you know by statistics or something that maybe 30 percent of priests are having sex or something like that then it's like a sociological problem at that point, right? Like where you're like, you're, the institution is lying in its face. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, lying at some level, if it's saying, if it's, it's, and I think that the, the problem was, especially in the United States in the post-war kind of period, there was this sort of accumulation of false valor or something like that from that the, you know, it's this idea that people aren't, flawed human people that are committing crimes all the time and stuff like that right it's this idea that the church is somehow better mm. or like things are or, or even the united states government or something like that is better or something right like where the yeah you get this idea that oh we're better so then you can't accuse us of being just average people in different ways right so um i think that's part of it i think that compounded the problem and then in addition to uh, not having good internal institutions to handle any of this kind of stuff so yeah I don't know. Yeah. Okay, let's move on here. Um, all right, I, I'll answer this one pretty quickly. This is addressed to Muslim Tom. Something you said a few accounts ago that I'm still thinking about is LGBTQ are political identities, not subjective realities. Could you could you dig into that? I promise I'm not trying to get you in trouble with this question. So I, I think I said that it, uh, LGBTQ are social political realities or maybe i said identities and not ontological realities so what what i mean by that is that the category 
gay, lesbian, trans, you know, whatever is, I believe now I could be wrong, but this is my belief is that that is not a ontological thing that you come into being as a member of one of these categories in the same way that you do not come into being as a member of a nation or even a religion or a gender or anything like that. I I think that um, like the ontological identity of someone is before it's prior to any of these categories. And I think sometimes that the arguments that you see for, you know, that are, are pro LGBT tend to conflate the two so that if someone is claiming an identity as, you know, any one of those types of identities, they are arguing or they tend to argue that it, it, the problem that I see here is that it, it essentially says that you have to accept that that line and that any other sort of framework for discussing something around sexual identity or or gender identity or anything like that is just on its face a kind of it's either just false or it's uh it gets construed as bigoted and i think that's really problematic because i mean you don't you can't a you can't prove any of this stuff so you sort of have to allow for uh, a variety of of perspectives and, and schemas to, to deal with these kinds of things. And it's, it's really not necessarily the case that one might view these things in a different kind of way uh, that doesn't necessarily say that, okay, well, some people are born in such that they are this category and that category. There, there needs to be an allowance for different uh, forms or like different, a different way of organizing uh, behaviors and identities and whatnot. Like in uh, in a lot of pre-modern contexts, people wouldn't have these identities. They wouldn't consider themselves gay if they uh, if they did, you know participated in homosexual behavior. They they would just see themselves as you know I don't know in in different ways. They just wouldn't adopt that label. And that doesn't mean that they were bigoted or that they were denying something about themselves. And I I just don't see why we need to discount any kind of perspective that might also, um, you know, not not uh, concern itself with those kinds of categories. So uh, obviously, I I sort of see this as a defense of a possible Islamic view on these types of things because the religion uh, doesn't really accept a lot of that kind of behavior. But I also don't think that it promotes like homophobia or persecution of people with, with those types of identities. I think we need to find a way that for, for Muslims or for, for an Islamic perspective that can stay true to the, the foundation of the religion. And, and, you know, we can't just undermine things because it doesn't fit the, the mainstream opinion these days. So, but at the same time, there you can't allow for something like homophobia because that, I mean, that wasn't something that uh, was running rampant prior to uh, the pro, pro, uh, the proliferation of these kinds of this kind of discourse. So th- there's there's basically like a conflict there where it's either you have to accept these this categorization and this kind of discourse, or you have to be homophobic. And I would hope that there's a way to you know, like a third option there. So, yeah. So that's what I have to say about that. Sure. Fun fact. In the 19th century, instead of pizza restaurants, politicians and police thought ice cream parlors were hotbeds of human trafficking, or as as they used to call it before the PC police came along, white slavery. Okay. So ice cream gate was the precursor to pizza. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I read, uh, apparently... One of the uh, I read this book about um, the debates that happened at the Constitutional Convention for the United States, um, and it was going through all the different characters that were involved and stuff, and you know, and and it uh, you know talked about their views on different things, and it's kind of funny because it just it just destroys to some degree like the more classical libertarian or you know conservative contemporary view of them being you know extreme libertarians or something that. Uh, and anyways, one of the things that it discusses is, uh, one of the, you know, constitutional, whatever delegates, whatever saying that he wanted to ban billiards <laughs> because he thought that like billiards was, uh, it was a way that like, you know, the bad sorts would gather together and, uh, yeah. play these, you know, games. And, and then there was also a, like a related thing was that 
they wanted to um, ban or tax. They wanted a power in the constitution to be able to regulate certain types of imports um, so that fancy clothes couldn't be imported because <laughs> they thought that like they didn't want a class of people to sort of take on airs and not be, you know, sort of Puritan, you know, simple dress kind of people that, you know, so that they wouldn't try to start a new royalty or stuff like that. Right. So that it was coherent with uh, their sort of sensibility about the way that people should, you know, uh, comport themselves. And I thought that was kind of funny because they uh, said in the actual convention, they said, you know, we don't really need to pass this as a separate law because I mean, a separate like, you know, plank or whatever, because that's obviously included in other powers or something like that. So it wasn't like some someone stood up and was like, sir, we shouldn't regulate what people wear. It was they were like, no, 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 that's actually common sense or something like that kind of thing that we just yeah. need. I don't know. I thought that was funny. And then uh, the other thing I, I read and when I read it, I was like a conservative at the time. And when I read it, I was like, what the hell? I was like, they uh, twice voted as like a group, whatever, you know, their big thing to uh, give a general grant of powers to the federal government like just just have like a clause or something that said you know anything that the gov congress needs to do for the goodwill or whatever you know like some something like that where they it would have let congress do anything it needed to do about anything basically it twice voted in favor of that so i thought that's also kind of funny like they did end up changing it to enumeration and then the reason why they enumerated it was because they thought they had basically included every power they could think of in there right it wasn't like it wasn't like oh no no we don't want them regulating healthcare which didn't really exist right it was just basically like you know it was like a uh, tonics or something right but like it was like so it, it, all, they thought that so what they did is they just gave all of the powers they could think of that weren't like specific ones about thing and they you know i don't know i thought that was kind of funny too yeah i don't know it's just silly it's funny cuz it just yeah it it totally explodes some of the more right wing arguments about that kind of stuff but yeah yeah that's pretty funny Okay, uh, next one here is how do you deal with failure? Um, not very good myself, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, uh, th yeah, the, the way I tend to deal with it is taking a nap or something. <laughs> I don't know, like just <laughs> just not like dealing with it at the time and, and then sort of taking uh, time to get back at it and once I have... Uh, thought it through and stuff i don't know yeah but uh no even like small things really bother me about that kind of stuff just i get easily frustrated about everything about like uh i don't know editing stuff or whatever just uh i start to i get really like freaked out about it for a second and it's funny because it's all at this point because i've experienced this for a long enough time is that it's all it's not really even intellectual at this point it just physically happens and then i'm like oh i'll just relax for a bit and then i'll get back at it and my brain will be okay or something like that kind of thing. <laughs> right. in a way that like agile tablet lab tablet would get like infuriated about or something i think because she always hates the uh, people re referring to their brain as an independent thing but like that's the way i have to kind of deal with it i just kind of go oh well i'm mad about this now but in a bit i won't be so i'll deal with that then or something so yeah yeah i think um I'm pretty good about this kind of thing. I guess I've had enough experience with it that I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I have a good attitude about it, basically. Like, I, I look at fail wins and failures as, like, a learning opportunity. Like, you look at what worked and what didn't work. So, I always, I don't know. I, all the kind of games and sports that I like are really heavy on fail cases and stuff. Like, you know, the classic example of baseball, if you bat, if you, if you, get out 70% of the time you're a, like a top tier player. Right. Yeah. And um, I like a lot of like video games that have you lose over and over again. And then you kind of learn how to work through that and stuff. So it, I kind of just see it as part, it, it's the process of learning something necessarily has you fail. Like if you just could, yeah. could succeed from the get go, you didn't learn anything. And I'm more interested in learning than I am in succeeding most of the time. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Stuff like that doesn't really bother me that much anymore. I think when I was younger, I used to get like anxiety about that kind of stuff and sure. be kind of like trying to avoid situations where I might yeah. fail. But I, I think I just kind of found myself in positions where I had to go for it regardless and then ended up failing. And I was like, oh, it, you know, you just live through it. Um, there's actually yeah. a line in the recognitions, which I've always really liked. I think this is one of the reasons that I uh, am so fond of the book. He's talking about sin and uh, how he's asking, how could Christ really know the temptation to sin if he was, 
you know, if he was Christ, like, and, and not one of us, right? Like, how could yeah, he, yeah. how could he be truly tempted uh, where, if he couldn't just live through the sin? So he, he kind of goes on this thing about uh, living it through instead of uh, rejecting it from some kind of like supreme will that's like never sure. going to be truly tempted. Like, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I kind of look at it like that. Like, you just live through it and you come out better on, on the other side of things, regardless. Like, even if, you know, your material situation maybe is worse for the failure, y- you learn something, hopefully. So, yeah, I'm getting better at like avoidant stuff through that. Like, it's been a hard one sort of lesson about that just to actually you know let things be painful and difficult and then just see what happens you know mm-hmm. um but that's been hard to do and uh the other thing though is is slightly different though i think in uh from that is that i am completely fine in some respects with sunk costs uh when it comes to you know like being 38 and not having you know like a lot of like i don't own a house or anything like that kind of thing you know what i mean like you know what i mean like yeah. a lot of the sort of basic things that for my like the educational and class position when I was about 20 years old or something like that you know like the the alternative timeline or something where my mental health was fine and all that like I understand it like intellectually I can go oh man there might have been all opportunities there that I missed but the actual like emotional level and the sort of rational thing I'm like oh no I don't care about that really like I I and much more interested in it's one of those things because I'm like I feel so grateful for a lot of the experiences I've had you know even just being able to get over things or think through things and stuff is uh it's it's so positive that it's like I wouldn't you know I don't want to redo anything I don't want to don't yeah. care about that and it's also like even like money wise and stuff it's like you know whatever it's just I'll figure things out over time it's not a big deal kind of thing so yeah uh okay so can you guys talk more about your Maoist days? Like, were you both Maoists at the same time? Was it because of each other? How did that come about? Um, so I think I think it was pretty much concurrent that we yeah. were into that kind of stuff in, in the same sort of way. And that was like, man, that was more than 10 years ago now. Yeah. Um, can't really pinpoint exactly how long that period lasted for me, but... A couple of years at least, if not more. I think it sort of got a little blurry and then kind of faded away for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, what would you say about those days? So, you know, I, I know, actually, I remember this. Uh, it's one of those things where my memory's not good in general, but I can remember ideological things pretty well. And uh, so I know in 2005, uh, I was reading a lot of like sort of Western Marxist stuff, like Frankfurt School, Lukash, and all that kind of stuff, like all that whatever and then 2006 i started to read a lot about mao and stalin and all that and then yeah in 2007 i was really like full on really interested in a lot of that stuff and really reading a lot about it and i remember in 2008 i actually at one point or something like that maybe 2007 i didn't register for an election that i was gonna like i had to register if i wanted to vote for the first time in quebec Mm -hmm. and uh, i didn't register because i was like Eh, that's just capitalist junk or something like that kind of thing. I was just like, I'm not going to bother. That was different because, I don't know, you know, it just, anyway, that's just an example of how, in my mind, a lot of that stuff just was just, anyways, pretty dominant. And then, yeah, I, I sort of, for a few years after that, I was, I don't know, I just read a lot about things related to it, but I didn't really, I don't know, it's one of those things where I never went whole hog into it kind of thing. Like, I really enjoyed it and I really was thinking about a lot but there was still a little bit of distance i think in my mind you know uh where there was no plan for me to uh do anything with it like it wasn't like you know i i i went to a lot of different meetings for things and it just didn't you know like the people involved were just wasting their time i thought like i didn't i you know i was maybe a potential recruit but i wasn't successfully recruited so i didn't really you know didn't really work out in their favor i guess or whoever you know so and then I started going to and reading more about more sort of, you know, socialism from below union organizing sort of things. Uh, and then I went to meetings for that and that actually worked out a lot and kind of got me back into the track to, in some respects with health improvements and stuff to get back into grad school and things. So I don't know. I think that was the timeline for me. Yeah. Um, at, yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think I'm like a, 
I was like two years behind you or so. 2007 is probably when I started to get into it. And yeah. like you, I was, oh, it was really more like a study and reading sort of interest more than anything yeah. practical. I think I can, I think the moment when I really realized like this isn't a real thing was when like in the sense of like, this isn't something I'm going to actually make, uh, you know, part of my life in any kind of real way was when I was in Palestine and realizing that if if i kind of if all the stuff that i'm deep into it, i mean like you I, there was always a little bit of a distance but you go so deep into something that your sense of what like a normal kind of distance position would be is still pretty far yeah, into yeah, yeah. that that uh sure. that world yeah that's a really good point yeah um that yeah i re just remember thinking like you know wouldn't shouldn't i be like doing something about the occupation here like it seems pretty easy to just walk up to one of these checkpoints and blow it up why you know they they just have you in lines and they don't check anyone until you're in the checkpoint yeah yeah walk in and blow the thing up so i was like yeah that seems pretty stupid and it like it wouldn't help anything yeah. and uh you know so that's not obviously that's not like the the main point of like maoism or whatever but it just seemed to to kind of like illustrate for me like yeah a lot of the kind of radicalism for its own sake seemed kind of just ridiculous and like why not yeah. i don't know it just helped me like uh refocus on a little bit more like okay what so what am i actually trying to do here kind of a thing and yeah. uh i i think i stopped looking into leftist theory and stuff like that for answers and started to look more at islam at that point i think up until that point i was always trying to find some kind of like synthesis between islam and and uh marxism or whatever and there there honestly is a lot of overlap in different things but uh, it always seemed like islam had the more practical solution for me so it was like this is what i can do as like a person i don't need to necessarily like get into some political party and like hope that they managed to fix the whole world like that's you know islam yeah. doesn't really look at things in terms of like we need to have this big radical change or whatever so uh yeah it just it just made a lot more sense for me i'm still yeah. very sympathetic to a lot of the the goals of the left and everything and i think a lot of the marxist critique of capitalism and all that makes a lot of sense and it's pretty sound but i, I also don't think it has all the answers at all like i i, I think you need it's like a supplemental idea. It, you, you can't reduce everything down to Marxism. Sure. Yeah, I think part of the whole thing that people might be asking about too is that the situation that we found ourselves kind of online and stuff on that kind of thing, like the 2007, 2008 was sort of the heyday of uh, sort of like the so, something awful political debates and all that kind of thing where we... Yeah. Did. And uh, and part of that was it was it was people playing with memes before that was like a word or a kind of thing. A lot of it, right. Like it was like, right. It was like a, and part of that was the sort of wild blogs that we found about monkey smashes heaven and third worldism and stuff. And yeah. there's also this parallel sort of thing of really a change in the left in some respects around uh, Israel and Palestine kind of stuff where you had a lot of people on the forum joking about supporting Hamas and all that. And uh, because that was like a very central you know, issue obviously with the Iraq war and all that too. And uh, so I think that those two strains of thought, like this kind of faux jihadi sort of joking kind of thing that we were making fun of soldiers with and stuff. And then the parallel thing of like the sort of extremist left uh, communist stuff. Um, and I think like a third thing that we didn't really, I mean, to some extent, but not really like was the gender feminist kind of thing, right? That was yeah. that evolved out of it to the same, I mean, you know, that in that, that was, I mean, that was reflected in that subculture there, I guess, kind of thing. So, um, and yeah. I think that actually sort of gave us a few years head start uh, in that community of um, knowing what was going to happen in terms of some of the ideological problems. But I think that like, uh, it shocked me how pervasive a lot of these uh, things kind of ended up uh, spinning out into a whole, you know, just thousands and thousands of people you see online with the same kind of communist avatars and all that kind of thing. It's just, yeah, it, it makes me think, me. it makes me think that similar things must have been going on in yeah. other, other places on sure. the internet. And then it kind of all bust out, yeah. and, like pooled together in the same sure. place on Twitter. Sure. And it also, it, I mean, it also at a deeper level, it, it suggests to me that there's some structural relationship there, right? Like there's, yeah. there's gotta be something that's driving people towards the same kind of outcomes. And 
you know, I don't know. I guess, you know, they like those people would probably say, or I mean, to some degree, we would probably say that there is some probably underlying truth to parts of it or something, right? But like, not the, you know, expression of identity across the whole board or something, right? But yeah, because I mean, a lot of there are contradictory identities too. So it's not necessarily like one outcome, yeah. but it's, yeah, so. Do you remember the thread that I made about Stalin where it was like happy birthday Stalin? And, and this was re- before, really before LF became like the, yeah. like the hard I, left kind of thing, but it was just people posting Stalin, Stalin, Stalin. Um, Was this, I don't remember. It was this when, no, I think that was later, but. Uh, I, I remember this really clearly because it really took off and it seemed okay. to be almost like the origin of that whole. Yeah, yeah color of the the form it, it, i yeah it was it was like this just an attempt to be like provocative because yeah. it was you know this was still like bashing ron paul and and yeah, trying yeah, yeah. to be like more radical than the the standard yeah. left you know that seems so inept so it was like okay well let's just like say stalin was great because that's going to really drive like libertarian yeah. crazy you know so it, yeah. it, it was stalin's birthday i think i saw that on wikipedia yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. So i just like copy pasted some stuff about stalin and like highlighted all these uh things about stalin that were so great or whatever i think i i copy pasted some old soviet like yeah, thing about funny. like how great stalin yeah. was and uh and then i at the end of it I, I made another post just as like a reply to it. They just had the word Stalin and then uh, maggot master. If you remember him, yep. Um, he posted Stalin the same way. And then a bunch of people started doing it. And then it just went on for like three, four or five pages. Just people saying Stalin, Stalin, Stalin. And I think that's when it really kind of kicked off. Like, Oh, we, we kind of have our own thing going here. People are sort of sure. into this, like, yeah. Freaking the squares kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that's that sort of thing. I think it was also, uh i i because I, I remember a lot of the there was the i don't know i think it might have been hezbollah like the um a lot of that like i don't i, I don't I remember like a maybe it was hamas but like there was something about the um which actually kind of is interesting in retrospect is that uh those were very much equated at the, in those years right yeah, like the, yeah the especially i mean to some extent uh um, I can remember a lot of sympathy for Al Qaeda in Iraq, right? Like it's, it's, I mean, it's very, it's strange in respect, in retrospect, that that was a pretty popular uh, meme kind of position, right? Where about because they were a leading force in the car bombs and stuff. I guess so. I don't know that. I mean, that's kind of a well, yeah. Know, I mean, yeah. in a way, yeah. it's more coherent than what you have today sure. because it's yeah. sort of like the enemy. You know, it comes out of a, a clear identification of who the enemy is. It's the occupying NATO forces. So anyone who's fighting them will just support them tactically as sure. like a kind of like in this propagandistic way or whatever and yeah. now people have like this much broader kind of bloated like world narrative about who's who's on the right side of things and everything and it, it tends to get pretty incoherent i think yeah and just as like a you know a thing about that is that i didn't visit the united states uh from 2007 to 2013 even though i live right near the border obviously but like um and i did have a little bit of a twinge that first time that i went across <laughs> In 2013, being like, uh, is there some note on a file somewhere that like some guy made that's like posted hundreds of memes about car bombs or something like that kind of thing? You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that uh, you know, or something like that. And uh, um, but uh, you know, and I guess you know, my name is uh, Scottish in origin, so I was fine. So you know. <laughs> okay, what's with Tom's anti-Jewish thing? Come on, man, chill. Um, I don't know that I have an anti-Jewish thing, so maybe that's a you problem, not a me problem. It's funny because, uh, um, there's a large amount right now of debate about anti-Semitism in the media because of like Corbyn to some extent, and then they try to transfer that over to Bernie Sanders. And then you get kind of this counter thing where it's like the Likudniks and stuff are the real anti-Semites and that kind of thing, which I always thought I, that just to, you know, just to think of something to say about this is you know is that i i think that's a move that you have to be really care- i mean there are a lot of jewish people that make this move and i understand that but i think that the, you have to be kind of careful about that in some respects because it's like i don't know it's like you're accusing me of it being anti-jewish but you're really anti-jewish or something that's kind of like i don't know there's something you gotta there's a line there that you want to be worried about i think because once you start saying well you're the real anti-semites or something like that then that's a pretty you know, if you're saying it's a weighty thing to call you, then you should be very careful, I think, about calling someone else that or something. I don't know. So I think the the reason one of the things that bothers me about this, I guess, is the 
you know that there's that uh, small group of uh, anti-Zionist Jews like that that are like yeah. explicitly right that are yeah. uh, um, and they sometimes are incorporated into left events or something you know or whatever like there's mm-hmm. they're they're part of that and people point to that and I, I think that's a very very thing to I don't know because the right wing does that too in their own way right like they have their own ways of doing that in terms of uh, you know the fundamentalist Christians will have groups of people who are uh, Jews for Jesus and things like that, right? Where they say, "Oh, we're Jewish and we love Christianity" or something, right? And it's like, yeah. it's like there's, I think there's like a, a very, very ide- ideological like danger there to sort of wade into that territory. I think it's, I think it's very, uh, I don't know. I and it's funny because I, I think you have to take it if people do the, do that as just an expression of extreme frustration. So like that's fine, you know what I mean? Like if you're extremely frustrated about it, but I feel like if you're not Jewish don't get involved in that debate kind of thing, right? Like don't like, don't to go too far into that territory and don't elevate groups that, you know, because otherwise you'll, uh, I think that there is, it's funny because it's like, there's this response that people naturally have online where they're saying, don't call us anti-Semitic. Uh, and then there's, there's just a natural meme response. I think where people go, don't call me anti-Semitic and then make, you know, some sort of anti-Semitic joke in their minds or, or whatever you you want to be i think that's it, to some extent it's just a natural response people have of being like you know the group that's annoying me needs to be made fun of and then but if that ever translates into a political thing it's just poisonous like it's just really really you have to be careful right. i think so i think making the joke is fine or whatever it, so, to some extent and i would defend that even if it's controversial do you know what i mean like i would i would say in a very thing like thing i think that there are a lot of jokes online where people make that sort of lightly joke about Jews or, you know, either way. And I think, you know, there's something to be said there about just calming down about that a bit, but like you really, really don't want to um, translate it into, you know, an automatic response or something like that, that get, goes too far or something. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there is definitely this sort of reaction that you get where they're extremely touchy and they'll, they'll be, very quick to label things as being anti-Semitic. And it's just, you know, a lot of it is just like a Zionist sort of like a defending Israel kind of thing. Yeah. And so that obviously makes it really fun to like poke fun at those types of people because they just overreacted at at everything. Right. Yeah. And it also, I mean, it also just to, you know, be clear about it, it does, it does make a lot of the individuals involved really annoying. Like, it's not like, it's not like a, not like, it's just a, it's just a true thing to say that like, uh, if you have someone that's like talking about how Hamas uses human shields to protect hospitals and just going on and on about it, you're like, you know, it's like a juicy target in your mind for trolling. It's just not, you know, you don't want to. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Yeah. You have to, and I think you have to, the, the thing is, I think it's important to admit that at some level or else then you kind of get into a really, you know, like where you're, you're, it's like you're being careful about what you're saying in public, but then privately you're being, saying something else or something, you know, like it's not, I don't know. Then I think that's how a lot of the alt-right stuff kind of gets some juice or whatever, you know, because it's like they get this sense that if someone's being annoying, then that means they're all evil or something. And then if you can't make fun of it because it's being protected somehow, it's like the Voltaire kind of cliche kind of thing or something, right? Like, yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, just, just to be clear, like a- anything I say, that's like inflammatory like that, if it's like anti women, anti whatever minority, anti Jewish, it's, it's because it's funny to mm-hmm. me that to do that and to see how people overreact to it when it's like, I'm never that bad. I mean, I don't know. Like yeah, yeah. I I'll, I can read the room. Like if there's like a group of people that I know understand that I'm joking, I'll go really crazy with it. But in, in a, if I'm speaking generally, I kind of, I, I know the people that are getting upset. 90% of them, they, they're not getting upset for real reasons or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I wonder what the person who sent this question is. Thanks about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you guys have any tips on never hurting anyone or making any mistakes and always getting everything right 100% of the time? I mean, most normal people are capable of it. I see it every day, but not continually fucking everything up or insulting humanity's sensibilities writ large with my very existence seems to have eluded me. Eagerly waiting your words of wisdom. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think they, this person wants us to point to the sign that says you can't win and then uh, <laughs> sort of remind them that you can't win. And yeah, 
No, it's it is one of it's frustrating uh, to live in the world, and <laughs> I don't know. It's like a I think it's a normal reaction to yeah feel like you're constantly making mistakes, but uh, the the truth is that most of those mistakes are probably not that big of a deal, and you can just kind of move on. Yeah, and um, you know you don't want to be thinking about you don't want to judge yourself in uh, it from this like imagined perspective of the crowd. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think you, a better way to look at it. I don't know what this person's like religious background is or whatever, but if you do believe in God, just, you, you, you know, you know that God made you that he kind of knows your, your faults and your struggles and all that kind of stuff. And all you can really do is do your best and then, you know, screw everybody else if they don't understand it or if they don't like it. You know what I mean? You, you, uh, yeah, that's that's about all I got for that one. Um, okay, why won't the cat walk on the Quran? I uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. I I yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I guess they just respect the Quran so much that they won't walk on it. Is there is there anything like in the Hadith or whatever about cats? Not, not really. Like there, um, I think the prophet had a pet cat. I could, I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but there definitely was a uh, companion of the prophet who was named uh, Abu Huraira, which means uh, father of the cats or father of the kittens. And that's because uh, he he had these robes that would have like big sleeves in them. And I, I understand that this story is told about other people as well. So I don't know what yeah. the actual origins of this is, but um, that he would keep kittens in his sleeves and he would walk around and, like that and just have like a bunch That's of funny. cats with him all the time. And he was, um, he's like the source of most of the Hadiths because he kind of made it like his personal job to like just follow the prophet around and, and write everything down that he could. Sure. Uh, whereas sure, most like... other people were just like going about their business and would report hadith just incidentally is there like explicit anti-dog stuff or is it like just a cultural uh, uh kind of thing? yes there are but it's very circumstantial and i think it's okay. been extrapolated to uh like in an undue kind of way so okay the the hadith that uh most you know like islamophobic type people will point to is a hadith about uh the prophet sanctioning throwing stones at black dogs and this comes from a when they went to what would later become medina it was uh, a town called yathrib so it changed its name to medina uh as yathrib was not a good place it was um it, it was like a really dirty, uh, diseased filled kind of place. And so there was all these, uh, stray, like rabid dogs running around mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they were dangerous. Like it, it, they're, they're not like domesticated dogs. These are just like wild animals. And so to drive them out of the town, he said like, yeah, you can, you can throw these rocks at, at these dogs and get them out of here basically. So yeah, so that's that's the hadith that sure. a lot of people point to as like, oh, that's that's the you know it's sanctioning animal abuse and and stuff. But there's so much more uh, that points to the fact that you can't harm an animal. Like there's um, a very famous story about a prostitute who uh, was going to the well to get some water and saw a a dog that was like really thirsty and filled up some water and gave it to the dog and because of that one act all of her previous sins and everything were um were like deleted and she was uh granted paradise because of that so uh you know and there's all kinds of stuff about like being nice to animals and stuff like the the sharia rulings on the slaughter you, you include like the psychological well-being of the animal like you can't slaughter the animal in front of another animal and the, the animal has to have had a nice uh, like life you have to give the water, uh, the animal a drink of water before you slaughter it. Like there's all kinds of stuff like that. Like, so the idea of like abusing dogs is okay because of this one incident where they had to drive out wild dogs. Is, uh, yeah. I don't think that, yeah. that, uh, holds up. Hmm. Um, but yeah. And I guess there is a Hadith about the, uh, that angels will not enter a house where dogs are barking, something like that. And some, you know, the standard take on that is, is basically like, you shouldn't let, you shouldn't keep dogs in your house because then the angels can't come in basically. But I, I kind of see that more as like, if you are letting like a crazy, loud, wild animal in your house, then there can't like peace can't come to your home. Right. So you need to yeah. like maintain it. So 
yeah, that, I don't know. That that's a little bit unorthodox, but it makes sense. So no, I think that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Should the Black Hills be returned to the Lakota people? Um, I don't really know much about that specific, you know, thing. But sure, I'm not using it for anything. They can have. It. I don't care. So I think uh, I think I've been there. I think that's one of the. I've not oh, really yeah. been to a lot of places in the states. Um, I've been to you know a few major cities, and then you know I went to sort of random places in the motorhome that we had. Um, and I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up right now just to prove in my mind that yeah. So I went to this place um, in South Dakota. I think I don't know. Maybe no. Maybe it was. Anyways, I went I went somewhere like this in uh, North or South Dakota or something uh, when I was younger. And uh, so, yeah, it was very beautiful. I say that uh, they do get it back. I'm going to, if you, uh, if you want me to be like an amicus brief or something on the um, legal team or whatever, I'll, I'll kind of send that in. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you get more pleasure from people rising to the bait on a troll or people recognizing the troll for what it is and enjoying it? Oof. Um, I think that, uh, I uh, yeah I I like more I, I mean it has to be both it can't be yeah that's what I was thinking know, it can't yeah. be one or the other because uh I really enjoy when other people like it but the the other thing is that to some degree uh at, at some level I don't care if other people I mean I do care but I care less if other people ever react to it or see it like I'm okay with most people not knowing that it even happened kind of thing. Like I'm okay with making a joke and only the person being annoyed and me knowing about it and then moving on. Yeah. Like uh, that's okay, but it's not ideal. I don't know. So. Yeah. I, I think I, mo- yeah, I don't need people to get it. Yeah. So most of the jokes that I make that people call trolls, I just think are funny things to say. Right. And then, and then most people, I assume, that are reading it are gonna agree that it's just something weird to say or something and might enjoy it or might not but they're gonna know that i'm joking kind of thing and then so i don't know I, to be honest i'm really confused a lot of the time when people that follow me or whatever are like oh you know it took me a while to figure out you're joking all the time or something i don't like that. get that either make sense it doesn't make any sense to me yeah because i don't even mean it like uh i don't yeah i don't mean it in like a negative way like that they uh you know are being dumb or something like that i just uh I just don't like, I feel like I being so obviously joking that the idea that I would think, you know, I don't know. I just, I just don't, I just, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. What a lot of comments about your jokes and stuff are kind of along the lines of like, Oh, I can't tell what he really believes or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think it's pretty clearly you don't believe the stuff you're joking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. It's a weird thing to me because maybe it's just because I know you too well or something. Yeah, but yeah, that yeah. has never really come into my mind as like, oh, he's being so ambiguous or, or yeah. inscrutable or something. Like it's, yeah. it's clear like he's just pointing to something or or making some kind of statement that's you know you're making it apparent how silly it is and it's funny and that's yeah. that's that. I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know. I. uh I also think that some like related to that too is that when I do post things that are just straightforwardly sincere, uh, they get very very little interaction usually. Like it's just it's just like I still do it because I think you know I'm just posting whatever I think kind of thing. But like uh, it's like you know people don't really care as much about you know local Ontario stuff or something like that kind of thing. It's not it's not like a, it's not really a big deal to most people that what I think about like what teachers heard going on strike about or something like that kind of thing, right? Like they it it's more like if I make a joke about Warren or something like that, then they'll care. But yeah, so. Hmm. Mm, okay. When the Ummah rises in Amrika and establishes the rule of Sharia, will Kakakanada be a, be declared a Wilayat or will it remain a separate entity? So uh, he's asking if the Caliphate of the United States will annex Canada or, or will it uh, ex- exist on its own? And uh, I don't know. I, I guess we'll have to see how things play out. But if our plans, you and I, Donald, work yeah. out the way they should, it should be a united, integral kind of thing. So Sure. Yeah. And uh, I am completely fine uh, with dimitude, whatever, like uh, being mm-hmm. a dimmy. I'm, I'm okay with that. I will pay jizya or whatever. And uh, um, yeah, I'm fine being, you know, a subject to, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm already, there's like an Anglican queen, right? So... <laughs> sort of the same thing in a way that I have to pay taxes to uh, 
Anglican queen. So, yeah. I think there's room for like non-Muslims in like all kinds of positions, you know, upper sure. level positions in the government yeah. society. So I don't, yeah. yeah. Dimitu doesn't mean like you're a second class citizen. That's a really sure. common misconception. It oh, just no, means yeah. You have a yeah. different tax status, basically. Sure. I could be like a tax collector or something, maybe even. So I could like you could be work the, on behalf of the jizya collector. I don't think yeah. you would be able to collect the shots. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and I could uh, ensure obedience to the new uh, Islamo Catholic regime. So yeah, day is full. Uh, who is the biggest celebrity you guys have either met or seen? Uh, okay, so I have some good ones for this. When I was in Thailand, I was interning at the embassy there. This was when I was a teenager. And Hillary Clinton, Chelsea Clinton, Madeleine Albright, and Colin Powell were all there to visit. I think the embassy had expanded recently and they were like there to like congratulate the staff on having a new building or something like that. Yeah. So uh, I got to shake the hands of the Clintons. Um, Albright wasn't there for that. And then I got to stand like seven, eight feet away from Colin Powell and scowl at him while he was giving his speech. <laughs> and this was like right after the Iraq war. So oh, I, right, right, right. Yeah. And and I, I may have mentioned this before. I think, uh, I think I told this story maybe on a, a premium episode, but as he was giving his speech, uh, you know, I'm glaring at him like hatefully and he notices me and I, I kind of see him like, look over at me and kind of like do a double take and it kind of like threw him off for a second. So uh, that, that was like my big, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> my big moment. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Um, yeah. I guess uh, because I was like a young Tory, young liberal kind of person for a few years, uh, I've met a bunch of, cause Canada, Canadian politics is not that, you know, high tier of a, you know, it's not like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's more like a governor of California level of thing. You know what I mean? It's not like president. Although it does have that, I don't know, you know, here, like obviously a lot of people do think that it's the biggest thing in the world, whatever, but it's just, it's uh so anyways, I've met, um, I think like five different prime ministers or something. So, um, and yeah, I don't know. And asked a lot of them questions about different things and, um, and I don't know. And they've, every single one that I've met has not kind of impressed me. I don't know. Like, I just, I'm like, whatever. I don't know. So I think that's kind of funny, but I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, I asked, uh, I asked Stephen Harper, um, before he became the leader of the conservatives, uh, you know, this is, this is deep wonkery nerd thing. But, uh, I said that in the past he had promised to cut, um, our national sales tax kind of thing, like the GST, um, from 7% to 5%. And that that would be like, that's a very expensive thing to do. I think it's like nowadays it would cost like maybe 20 billion a year or something to do that. So it's just a huge amount of money mm -hmm. to do that. Maybe, maybe 10, I don't know, but like the, so I asked why he would do that if uh, it was so expensive and economists aren't, don't say that's a good tax to cut. Like it doesn't, it doesn't like spur investment or do anything kind of thing. So I said, that doesn't really make sense. And his answer was basically, you know, in the, in the coded kind of, he's an economist. So coded economist way was basically, you got to throw something to the rubes kind of thing. Like that was, <laughs> that was basically his, his answer was kind of like, oh, we need to, you know, have a sticker kind of thing like that. We can say, we're going to do that. And then people will vote for us and we'll do it. And, you know, that was his kind of sell on that was, I know it doesn't really make sense, but we got to do it anyways, which was kind of a insightful thing. You know, I was like helpful for me to see that when I was conservative and then basically gave up on that kind of stuff because he then won the 2006 election or well, 2004, but then he, you know, won the 2004 election as a minority and then won, or sorry, you know, in 2006, he won, sorry, as a minority. And then he did that. He, he cut the rate from seven to 5%. So just to go for the roots kind of thing or something that like he, he ended up doing it. So I was kind of like, Oh, uh, politics, politics sucks. <laughs> I don't know. Like it just, I was like, Oh, that doesn't, that's not good. So anyways, and, uh, it like blew a hole in the budget, which we haven't really recovered from, I guess. So anyways. Yeah. I don't think I've met any other celebrities. Yeah. I, I mean, I also, I went to Washington DC in November, 2001 or something and saw a lot of these people in the Senate from like the gallery, which counts, I think, because you're still in the same room with them. You can like see them. Yeah. There's like John McCain and, and uh, Hillary Clinton and all those people. And they rolled out Strom Thurmond to vote for something. Nice. And uh, he uh, was obviously like not like just not there at all. Just they just rolled him out and got him to vote. Whatever. That's why. Uh, yeah. And uh, I don't know. So 
Yeah. Uh, Donald, are you toking on a fat joint as we speak? No, so I haven't even moved forward with that with that plan yet. Uh, It'd be a I, lot uh, cooler if you did. Yeah, it would be. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm I'm looking forward to it, but I just uh, it's I've had a lot of like it's kind of funny because I've had a lot of minor health elements that bothered me. It's mm-hmm. like I'll just pass on this for now, and it, it, I mean I feel like and now I've kind of in the last few days I've actually switched my mind on that a bit, where I'm like this is actually a good idea <laughs> because. Uh, it might actually help some of the headaches and stuff, whatever. So, yeah. All right. Will you guys ever do a Twitch stream? I think I could watch one of you play Witcher 3 while the other commentates or like Hearts of Iron or CK2 or something. Um, This is honestly something that people request fairly often. We should probably figure out a way to do it. Oh, you'd be up for it? I guess guess so, yeah. So the only games I play nowadays are... Magic the Gathering Arena yeah. and XCOM 2. I was playing that a bit, but like the new Magic set just came out, so I'm gonna oh, be yeah. playing that all the time, I think. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know I'm not, if yeah. anyone wants to watch that. <laughs> I know, I, I would have to, I'd have to sort of dive into that world a bit, maybe to figure it out. Because I tried to watch um Felix playing uh Fortnite on a Twitch stream, and I honestly had no idea what was going on, really. Like, I just really couldn't wrap my mind around the game. and I'm not like a dumb man. I just, you know, it's just like, no, I, Fortnite <laughs> is, is made for like 15 year olds with ADD. Yeah. That's, that's so, not like a, yeah. yeah. So I know that some people do stuff like they watch YouTube videos on it and then comment while it's, you know, kind of, I don't know. It, it seems it, a lot of it seems like almost like a, like a B level podcast or something kind of like I, like concept kind of thing. Like you kind right. of have, it's not really, uh, but you know, it seems to be wildly popular right now. So I'm not against, uh, going with the crowd. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should do some of those paradox games or I could do some red orchestra. I think people might be into that for like Soviet nostalgia yeah. Kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I can comment on that or something. Yeah. I'm not really, I think that maybe I could do it too, but for like, uh, I don't know. It would have to be like playing Mario or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Maybe I could play and you could like uh, talk to the chat. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, like yeah. I would do the commenting, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we're working on it, and I think Andy uh, has expressed some interest in doing something along those lines. So maybe we'll do a, a you can't win streamer team or something like that. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay. Uh, okay. Why does Don do the delete and donate likes thing? I wanted to show my friends some really funny thing he wrote on Twitter, and when I checked, it wasn't there anymore. Now, as a consequence, they cut my clothes off with a knife and put me naked in stress positions while sh- shouting, where's the funny? Where's the funny, motherfucker? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I started doing that as a joke uh, early on because uh, I thought, it. I don't know, there's just something, I, I can't even like maybe full express it, but it's just there's something weird to me about the whole like there's a certain point in the algorithm where it just becomes self-sustaining and you're going to end up having like 50 K likes or something like that kind of thing. It's just going to keep going. Uh, if you keep, you know I mean? It's just gonna, it's just gonna go crazy. And there's something about, I mean, it's, it sounds stupid now because it's, it's, it's not really played out the way that I expected it to, but, uh, it was like deliberate self-sabotage in a way, because if you get like a enormous tweet like that kind of thing, uh, lots of people will follow you and, mm-hmm. and and most of them will probably not even never ever read a tweet of yours basically like it's just yeah. it's just it's just numbers on your account but that and so i thought it was funny and i also did this thing people don't really notice this thing as much but i've done it a few times before i haven't done it in recent years because it's too hard um i would systematically go through my uh followers and block any account that was not like a person like i would just go through and if it was like a bot or uh, just a fake account or like an institutional kind of thing, like, you know, you know, whatever media or whatever, that was just like a fake, you know, trying to get, like get a sale out of it or something. Right. Um, I would just uh, systematically block them so that my follower account would go down. And I thought that was like funny because I was like, it's, 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 it's going against the logic of the whole operation basically. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't know. I just thought it was funny to do that because there's a lot of people who are like grasping on the thing kind of thing, right? They're trying to, and I think there's something that you, that there's, there's like at least a percentage of that in what you're doing. Even if you're just putting out jokes that are, you know, for yourself and your friends and stuff, there's still that kind of level of 
you know, it's nice to see if a tweet does really well kind of thing, right? Like, so, sure, yeah. I don't know. I, I thought it was like a funny thing to counteract that in certain ways. And uh, I think it's also funny because it it's like a, I don't know, there's like a chain of logic there where it's funny to me that other people wouldn't do that ever. Some Some certain people wouldn't, right? There's certain people that are, you can tell that if they had a really popular tweet, we just would just, Anyways, they would just really, really double down on that and reply to it a lot saying like, look at this or look at that that I do and stuff. And instead, this is kind of like a sabotage, self-sabotage kind of thing or something. I don't know. So, yeah. But it it didn't really uh, work because to, to really get that effect, I would have to delete it like after like an hour or something, right? Like I can't. It, the problem is that I want it to be up long enough that people that I know see it. Right. So it does. it kind of, it doesn't really work because if it's been up for like 12 hours, then all the people that were going to follow you from it anyways are already doing that kind of thing. Right. So anyway, so yeah. Okay. Um, last yeah. one here, I think, what does Tom do for work? I know he has clients, but that's all. Uh, I'm the chief of police at the CIA and the clients that you're referring to are people like Bolsonaro and Duterte and uh, some minor Russian oligarchs, things like that. I sort of coordinate uh, global schemes to promote capitalism and um, reaction against communism around the world. Yeah. And my particular role in this, I actually work for Tom sort of indirectly. What I do is I gather anytime like a leftist online messages me or shares information with me i write up a report about it in detail like all their details and and uh and also i give detailed reports about like the sense of the left kind of thing like what the left is doing about this or that what they're thinking about this or that especially people that i know pretty well who might be of value to the fbi one day or something um and they have promised me um a large pension so it, i actually don't see the money yet which is why i have to live at home oh it's coming and but it's one of those things where you kind of you know i can't change my behavior now because that would tip people off right but in the future i will be taken care of and my family you know will not be uh um, kidnapped so that's kind of a important thing to me so yeah yeah i mean we should probably delete this but i don't think anyone is yeah no one's gonna believe it so no no one's gonna believe it no one listens yeah it's, sure it's at yeah. the very end of the episode i think we're yeah this is just sitting on someone's podcast right now and they could get me in trouble for it but you know they probably won't because it you know won't get to this far so yeah yeah uh okay yeah so we'll wrap it up there thanks for listening guys if you want a second episode of you can't win every week you can subscribe to our patreon and you'll get access to that and all our past premium episodes you'll also get access to our discord where you can talk to us in our community and you can submit questions for the premium episodes which we answer every week and uh yeah i hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll catch you again next week Birds of a feather, we rock together. And if we got a problem, we talk together. So let's head down south, escape the bad weather. Ooh, 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 ooh. The rain came through my treetop and washed away so many things. Things I couldn't learn till I went through.